Steve, what do you think of our Lincoln ride? On a scale of one to 10, I give it a D. <laughs> yeah, this is, this <laughs> is class. First class, <laughs> you, you really know how to ride in style, John. No doubt about it. You know, I'm suspecting that Woo. the airbags are totally blown out, Dave. This is a no-brainer. No doubt, we have to get this into Tech Garage right away. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Aha, just like that, no more parasitic draw. And that's a good thing. Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, it's pretty obvious what this show is all about. We have a low rider, and we really don't want a low rider. You may love them, that's great, but this Lincoln, we want to restore it back to back the factory ride, keep it nice. A couple things we did, Dave, we put a new battery in from rockauto.com because it's actually running that pump once in a while, we're suspecting. Just top that off, make sure it's in good shape, no problems here. Yeah, John, these Lincolns and, and these Fords are famous for their air ride system, which is cool, but they're infamous because of all the problems. They're very sophisticated systems, and they can run into a lot of things. There's a lot of moving parts, and there we go. So we got this pump that is running and is annoying, and we will unhook it, uh, take the power out. We're going to delete this thing anyway because, it, like I said, it's complicated. We're just going to go back to a traditional system and take this out of the loop altogether. I'll tell you what, Rock Auto has a deletion kit for this car and many other ones just like this. So I'll get a demo set up on a table. We'll look at the deletion kit. We'll look at the air ride replacement. You guys can make your own decision. Dave, you're on your own. You got it, John. I just want to show you a couple of basic things about this system. This is the actual pump motor right here. And over on the side is a dryer, and that's kind of a key component. This is just like your compressor at home. You have to uh, empty the compressor because water gets in there. Well, that water can create problems when it penetrates the entire system, and that is precisely what we have going on with this automobile right here. John is going to show us how all this works. Well, our whole Lincoln suspension laid out on a table. All starts right here with the height sensor. Actually goes up and down. When it goes up and down, it's connected to the frame and the suspension, reports to the computer. The computer then runs the air pump that Dave showed you earlier. Here's the air pump, and it sends a signal over to the airbag, the air spring system, to go up or down. Now, what they're going to run into over there is they have a clip on the top. You're not going to be able to see that because it's buried up in there, but they're going to have to pop that off. Let's get a screwdriver up in the frame and pop that off, and this is an actual air solenoid right here. One, back, two, and out. So two locks out, and then it's sitting there right there. Then they come to the top right there. You can see that clip. Reach up in there, get your pair of pliers, pull that off, and the top of the bag will be ready to come out. Matter of fact, I think theirs is about ready to come out. Well, it's exactly what we thought it was, John. We checked underneath, and I tell you what, these airbags, Josh, are flat as a pancake. They are. Well, well what we have to do now is take them out. So the first thing we need to do is on top, there's a clip. It's a little bit of a pain to get off. And even more difficult, if you try to take off the solenoid without taking off this clip, you're going for a world of hurt. You but speak from experience? I do, I do. <laughs> but the next thing we do, I've already loosened these up, so they're just finger tight. We'll go ahead and take off these bolts on the bottom of the shock. All right. Just loosen up the nut. Just pop that bolt out. And once that's out, just set it to the side. This is a little stubborn, but we got it. I think I got it. All right, there we go. All right, we'll set it to the side. Next thing we need to do was we'll just lower these jacks simultaneously. Okay. Let's try to do this together. Swing this out. All right, yes, sir. And once we get this down, I should be able to pop out that airbag on top. It's already loose. Things in terrible, terrible that shape. Awful. Awful. All right, good. Now I'm loose enough. I can grab my pry bar, push up on this. Uh, now I'll work this thing out. Oh my goodness. There's your rubber mess. pancake, Dave. Wow, this thing has seen better days, believe me. Holy cow. We're going to get this thing put back together, replace the system altogether when we come back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com is brought to you by Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. Clamp tight, the clamp making tool. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. You know, spring is here. No, really, spring is here. 
but it's going to be up there as we put our suspension back together, John. Yeah, boy, Dave, I came at the right time. Looks like all the dirty work's been done. But before we throw that spring up in there, let's talk a little bit about independent and non-independent suspensions. That's where it all starts. This one right here, this is an actually non-independent suspension. Why? Because it's one rigid axle all the way across. When one wheel hits a bump, the other's affected. You can look at the bottom of the graphic right there. The lower one, that's an independent suspension system. Why? Well, you see one wheel's not connected to the other. When you hit the bumps, you're not going to feel it. A little higher end, kind of nice ride with that. We've got coil springs on this one, and we're going to put one in right now. Yeah, we've got a couple of options, Dave. We can take all the control arms off, but, you know, I'm close to 200. Don't go there. Maybe I can just hang on this differential. I'm not going to mess with the brake line or anything, and see if you can kind of snake it up in there. I'll move this shock for you. Always best to keep it simple. Yep, maybe we can get lucky here and ready. not have to disassemble the whole thing. Yep, see if you can get it up in there. Once you get it up in there, just kind of get it positioned, and I'll hang down okay. for you. You ready? Let's do Let's it. See if I can do this. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Wow, Got look it. at that. I'm going to do a couple Let of chin-ups while I'm there. There you go. <laughs> and zero. Perfect. That's me, yeah. Nice, okay. Well, we got that in now. Now all we really have to do is just kind of compress it. You know, springs control ride high, shocks control spring oscillation. So let's go ahead and screw it up. Once we get the screw jacks up, we'll line up this and get going. While we're at it, let's talk about a couple of different types of suspension systems. Yeah, John, first there's a leaf spring, and that's the most primitive. In fact, it's been around since Roman times. They actually use pieces of leather to make leaf springs, and it hasn't really changed much since then. Yeah, they're, they're made out of steel, but the basic design has lasted forever and ever. Wow, I did not know that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and they're pretty neat because it's usually on non-independent suspension systems. you got a shackle on the back that allows it to change lengths as you hit bumps. you got a pin in the middle. When you're diagnosing those, just tug and pull them, make sure everything's secure, look at your little eyelets, you know. Then they went to torsion bars, Dave. Yeah, and those are usually used on four-wheel drive vehicles uh, for the most part. Yeah, the four-wheel drives use the torsion bars. They're connected to the frame of the vehicle. Then they go up usually to a lower control arm in the front. And those are springs, so they're under twisting force. Matter of fact, they're under immense amount of twisting force, so be super careful. They don't look like a spring, but they are a spring. Dave, I'm almost there. How are you? Not just about where you are. All right, well, come on. We'll take it up a couple more turns and line it up. Meanwhile, a couple other suspensions, Dave. Uh, air suspension, <laughs> you're a pretty expert with that. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, we have air, had air suspension on this. We decided to take it off. It's a much more complicated system than we're going to be putting in. The nice thing about air suspension, if, well, yes, it does act as a regular shock and absorbs the bumps but it also allows you to adjust the ride height if that's what you what you need to do. And that's cool. And, and remember, all springs control ride height, shocks control spring oscillation. So if you have a problem, check your spring. And then the last one is the coil springs. Well, that's what we just put in here. We changed this from an air ride to a coil springs. Could be independent or non-independent. Doesn't make any difference. Wow, this thing's looking good, Dave. What do you think? Now, all we got to do is tighten these up. We'll be good to go. Yep, we're going to drop it down, do the final torque specs, but we got to bounce for a minute. See what you did there. Yep. We'll be right back with more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. 329 million people live in the U.S. and about 88% of those people own cars. That's second only to Italy and it's a stark contrast to the rest of the world where car ownership averages only 35%. More Tech Garage coming right up. Boy, we are rolling along. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, it's garage ed time, and we've talked about brake fundamentals in show one. Then we looked at different calipers and rotors. It only makes sense to turn our attention to brake pads. And brake pads, once again, come in all shapes, sizes, and flavors. So let's start out here with metallic brake pads. Now, metallic brake pads, they're basically just fully metal pads. You don't see those on a lot of passenger cars. You see them on those race cars. Boy, if you ever watch the race at night and you see those rotors are glowing super red, that's because they last forever, they're metal, but boy, they get hot. They get super, super hot, but they can handle the heat and they can handle a long race. What we use on our passenger cars is usually these semi-metallic pads, that's pretty good. This is a hybrid technology, but there's all kinds of material in there. It's just your regular run-of-the-mill semi-metallic pad. A lot of manufacturers put them on the car. These are great sets. I got all these sets at rockauto.com. They got premium brake pads or choices across the line. But semi-metallic pads have a little bit of metal in there. You may get a little squeal. They're gonna last about middle of the road versus the metallic pads lasting forever, but not as good as stopping power as the actual semi-metallic. 
Then what we ran into is ceramic pads. This is pretty cool. Ceramic pads have really good stopping capability. They also withstand the heat. On a lot of multiple stops, they can dissipate it and get rid of it. And what I like about the ceramic pads is you still get the brake dust, but the brake dust is white, so you don't get all the black rims on there. Really, really nice choice, ceramic brake pads, but definitely look at your manufacturer specification and see what they call for. That's what you want to use. Now, when it comes to brake pads, there's also a deal called a brake pad wear indicator. Something that's gonna let you know as a driver, either audible, tactile, some way, that your pads are starting to wear out. And I have one right here, you can see. This little metal comes out to the pad and it comes down to about right here. So once that pad starts to wear past that point, this is gonna scrape the rotor. Now this is a softer metal than the rotor, so it shouldn't hurt the rotor, but you're gonna get that audible chirp. Chirp, 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 as you're driving. Now, if you got a lot of money like Dave and you drive a high performance car, you may actually have an electronic sensor. This is really cool. Let's come off a BMW and you just replace the electronic sensor in the next set of pads, you put it in there, and when it touches, it grounds it out a circuit and it lets the driver know it's time to replace the brake pads. Also, a couple segments ago, you're gonna have to rewind, but we talked about the importance of the hardware and the pads moving. If you get associated hardware, put it on. You want this pad to slide back and forth. This one right here, not so much. It's gonna stick, it's gonna have problems. Make sure it's clean. It's all about that coefficient of friction, making sure that you have that good contact surface. You definitely don't want them to be messed up or dirty. Speaking of dirty, that's we get that complaint a lot about brake squeal and noises coming from the brakes, and it's usually because they're dirty, John. And there's something you can do. Now, I pulled this one off here. This pad, of course, probably should be replaced, sure. but for sake of demonstration, we'll show you how to clean them up. You can see the shiny surface on this side, and uh, there's a simple solution right here. You grab some sandpaper, put it on a flat surface, and you can start to rub it. You can see the dirt coming off of that already. Yep. And uh, all the grime. There's brake dust on here. There's dust from the road. All kinds of mud that collects on these. And just with a little bit of that, you can see we're already starting to get some of the shiny off. Get some of the, the surface there. Uh, it's more grippy. Uh, for yeah, lack of grippy. A better term for your brakes. Perfect. So you're yeah. making that good coefficient of friction. You can see the shine's going. Just keep going. Keep it level. Beautiful. All that dust come off. You're back to that high coefficient of friction. Now you got another trick to help with the sound. Sure. And uh, this one's uh, also super simple. So I'll throw this out here. Looking at the other side, you can see we've cleaned it up a bit. Uh, but you, maybe you're still wanting to get rid of that squeal. And here's a good way to do it. This is uh, called disc brake quiet. Uh, the name kind of says it all here. It uh, keeps your brakes quiet. You want to get rid of that sound. So spray a little of this on. Wait a few minutes, so about five minutes or so, you'll be ready to go here. And this creates sort of a, a rubber surface on the back, and that will eliminate some of the noise. It'll absorb the sound, and you'll be able to uh, drive noise-free, and you'll just feel better about your ride. Exactly. So that's going to work out real good for you. You may have put some new pads on. You didn't clean them up real well. That's an issue. Dave, incredible. You know what? It's time to turn our attention to the Master Technician Tech Tip. And trust me, it's going to be cool. Huh, we're talking about cooling systems. It's cool because you're in it. There you go. <laughs> we'll be right back with more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Can't get enough of Tech Garage? Well, you can see what we're up to during the week by hitting up our Facebook page. You can even drop us a note there to say hello. And you can go online to catch up on past seasons. You can find every single episode of Tech Garage at Masters TV. Dot com. Do not go anywhere because Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, will be right back. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by NH Oil Undercoating, the official oil-based rust prevention system. Steel rubber products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping. And by rockauto.com. All the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. One of our favorite segments, and yours too, MTTT, say what? That's right, Master Technician Tech Tip. And this one's all about coolants, man. There are so many different types of coolants on a car. We need to understand everything about them. And let's start with our cool engine demo and look at actually coolant and how it works. What is a coolant system? Well, it starts here at the radiator and it goes through the engine. It's all about that thermodynamics. We're taking the heat out of the engine, Boom, and throwing it to the outside air. And here's a couple of tech tips for you. The first thing you can do if your engine's nice and cool, make sure it's not hot, but you can go down here and you can feel the front of your radiator. You know, you wanna feel for any ice cold spots, perhaps it's warm, 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 and now I'm coming over here, 
and I got a cold spot, well, that could be an actual spot where the coolant's not running through it because the coolant goes through it and it dissipates the heat. The whole radiator should be uniformly warm all the way down it. Now, a couple other things. This is pretty cool. At rockauto.com, we got this pressure tester right here. Now, professional shops do this, but you can do it right out in the driveway. I'm going to come over and run a pressure test on this system. Well, what's a pressure test? Just like it says, we're putting pressure in the system. So once your engine's cold, do not take the radiator cap off when it's hot. Not a good idea. Make sure it's cold. I got the radiator cap off. I'm simply just going to take a pressure tester. That's exactly what this is. Put it down on here on the system. I'm going to secure the cap, and then what we're going to do is just like your system would, add pressure to the system. So if I come over here and I start pumping this up, I'm actually adding pressure to the system. All the coolant hoses are swollen up. I don't want to add any more than what the cap specifies, but I put the pressure in there. And now what do we do? Well, we just sit and wait. And when I'm waiting, I'm actually looking for it. If it's holding steady, maybe five or 10 minutes, you're in good shape. But if it starts to drop slowly, that coolant's going somewhere, the pressure. You could have one or two leaks. You can have an external leak, which simply just go around and look around the engine and see if it's dripping, find out where it's dripping from. That's not a problem. But you also could have an internal leak. Maybe the head gasket's blown going into the cylinders. You may have to run some deeper tests to find out about that or look for some steam coming out of the exhaust, a blown head gasket's a good indication of that as it starts to drop down. Now another one you can do is you can test the cap. The cap is an important part of the system. I'll take this off of this one here and we'll bring it over and we'll go ahead and test a cap. So let me get this off of here. Now the cap holds pressure. So when it holds pressure, it actually raises the boiling point. That's important because water boils at 212 degrees and we don't want it to boil any lower than that. We actually want to raise it up. So I got this here, I'm gonna put it on the cap. Now when I put it on the cap, I'm just gonna let the cap dangle here so you can see the gauge. And I'm gonna put the gauge. So it's a sealed system right now. So what's gonna happen is I start to pump up the cap. When I pump up the cap, you're gonna see the pressure rise. So the pressure starts to rise and then I keep pressing and I can't get any more, it stops. What's happening? The cap's blowing off at a specific pressure. What's that pressure? Look on your cap, look in your service manual. Make sure it holds pressure and then it blows off at excessive pressure. Those are two great tech tips that'll help keep your coolant system in tip top shape. Now also with coolant, man, there's so many different types of coolant and there's gauges too to look at some of the stuff. I got this at rockauto.com as well. So right here I have an actual hydrometer that's gonna go ahead and take some of the coolant up and we're gonna look at the freezing point in the coolant. So I can come right to the coolant once again. Be safe, make sure everything's in good shape. Make sure you're not gonna get too hot. And you see the ne little needle floating right there? Now the little needle's telling us the protection of it. So that's a real simple thing you can do right out in the driveway. Check your coolant and the level. It's actually checking the specific gravity and the weight of the coolant. Or you can get some test strips. You can dip them in there and then compare it to the container. Once you dip it in there and compare it to the container, well, it's simply just look at it and see if you need some new coolant. Now, another cool tool I have is a refractometer. Got this at rockauto.com too, right here. This is neat because it's high tech, but you know what? It's not even expensive. You can come over here, get your little dab of coolant, put it on here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close the lid. Once I close the lid, I'm gonna look through it into the light. Now you can see it just exactly what I'm looking at. You can see the graphic right there and you're looking at the protection level of the coolant. It does battery fluid, it does coolant, does ethylene glycol. So that's a refractometer, that's incredible. Now, here's the coolant. I love my coolant collage. We're gonna talk about Asian coolants, we're gonna talk about regular coolants, domestic coolants, but man, there's just so many flavors, so many shapes, so many sizes of coolant. You have to use the right one. So what are we gonna do? Well, you know, I'm gonna go ahead, our co-host is over there, Dave, and he's got a son named Lincoln that would love to come over here and dunk some eggs in this coolant. So I'm gonna get rid of this to keep him safe, but we're gonna check in with Dave and Tom. They're gonna to tell us all we need to know about coolants. Well, John, choosing an antifreeze seems like it can be such a complicated decision, but at rockauto.com, how have you simplified that, Tom? Well, like our, with our replacement parts, the antifreeze is listed under sp for specific vehicles. So you just go to cooling system and click under that and there's coolant antifreeze and it lists the correct antifreeze for your vehicle. It, it used to be you know, 30 years ago, everybody, all the engines used the green antifreeze that ubiquitous. 
And now you have a lot of choices, and what's most confusing is there'll often be on the bottle it'll say phosphate-free or silicate-free as, as if those are bad things, like I want to avoid those, and that's not the case. It's just that's not right for your specific vehicle. So for example, th th this gold bottle, it, it says phosphate-free on the front. That's because it's for European brand vehicles. The European brands, they're worried about hard water reacting with the phosphate and creating scale. But over here we have antifreeze made for Asian brands like Hyundai, Honda, that actually prefer phosphates because it, it resists corrosion. But the Asian brands don't like silicates because they're concerned about it reacting with some of their gaskets for water pumps or whatever. But the European brands like silicates for resisting corrosion. So it, it all depends on the brand of your vehicle, which antifreeze it prefers. And yeah, you go to our catalog, it'll, you don't have to do this sorting out. It, we tell you which antifreeze is right for your car. Well, you can find the antifreeze or part that's right for your vehicle, and it's all at reliably low prices at rockauto.com. Nice, correct ride height and bounce test, jounce test. Oh, oh sweet. much better, man. That thing was a roller coaster ride before this. Yeah, it was, and now it's all fixed up. We're ready to go. What a great day it was today. I hope you guys had a good time. I know we sure did. Check us out on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all that cool stuff. But no worries. We'll be back next week with more Tech Garage brought to you by rockauto.com. Bam, another win. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Chipola College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Chipola was ranked recently as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.